Welcome, friends. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. It is uh, just a delight to be with you, to be here in Atlanta. And what I want to do is share with you our dream. It's very simple. In the next generation, we want to see a new reformation. We want to see the reformation of Christ's church worldwide. Not a reaction to some new idea or threat. We have a lot of that going on. Not some nostalgic remembering of what God did do 500 years ago. That's not what we're talking about, a reformation of Christ's church today. Now, I think many today would recognize the need for reformation because the problems in the churches, the problems we see not just in the church in America but in the church worldwide are pretty obvious. We see the church racked by tribalism by petty feuds over issues that are not the gospel, that are sometimes personality-based, empire-building, failing leaders, the rarity of integrity. And yet I think while Christians bemoan that, The theological roots of our sickness today, because they are roots, remain invisible to most. And so it was actually in the years running up to the Reformation 500 years ago, that in the late Middle Ages, Ages, many people saw there is a need for the church to be reformed. And so monastic orders set about reforming themselves. Even the papacy went through some attempts at reform because everyone recognized, yes, there are some rotten apples. There are some dead branches that needed pruning. People saw it. And for most people 500 years ago, the solution was pretty simple and pretty superficial. Give the church a good moral scrub. That'll do it. And what made Martin Luther so very different was that Luther appreciated the depth of the problem. A truly transformative reformation and renewal of the church. He saw required dealing with the theological causes of its trouble. And likewise today, the moral deficiencies, the spiritual dryness that we see in the church today, it has roots. So our need, I want to suggest, to you, friends, is not just for a moral integrity. What we need today is a gospel integrity. Without the gospel, all our attempts at reform will be superficial. And so reformation means it's always meant a purifying, a renewing, an awakening of the church through a fresh recovery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Reformation Fellowship is to be a gathering together, a supportive fellowship around helping each other as we serve this gospel, this vision. So what I want to do as we kick off our time together, is to get clear what gospel are we talking about. 
So if it is the gospel that will bring reformation to the church today, if it is the gospel that can bring the true unity that Jesus prayed for, if it is the gospel that is what we are called to fellowship around rather than secondary issues of how you run a church and how you vote, if it is the gospel that is the real cause of our unity, let's get clear what is the gospel. And we'll be pressing into this in our time together. But I want to introduce this gospel to you now. What gospel brings reformation? Would you turn with me to Romans and just the first few verses? Let's look at how the Apostle Paul speaks of the gospel. Here is opening lines. Romans 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which, now track the logic here, he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who is descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you see there are four things going on there? So do you see, for Paul, the gospel is Trinitarian. It is the good news of the Father concerning the Son who is declared Son of God in power according to the Spirit. It's a Trinitarian gospel. No gospel without this God. Second, it is, verse 2, a biblical gospel. It is proclaimed through the Holy Scriptures. Third, verse 3, it is a Christ-centered message. It concerns God's Son. And four, verse 4, it is spirit-affected. It is by the Spirit that the Son is revealed. And that's going to be the logic of what we're looking at over the next day. Those features, that gospel as Paul describes it. And you know, it's, it's the same throughout Paul's letters in 1 Corinthians. Paul says he preaches the wisdom of God Knowing, he says, nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So it's the wisdom of God about Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he says he does that preaching in demonstration of the spirit and power. See Trinitarian? Christ-centered in the power of the spirit. In Galatians, Paul says he preaches a gospel that he received as a revelation. It concerns the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. May I preach no other message? And it means that a work is done in believers such that they are a new creation. The Spirit's work in their hearts. And so, if we are to have an apostolic understanding of the gospel, we need to see that, as Paul speaks it, apostolic te teaching speaks of the essential qualities of being Trinitarian, Scripture-based, Christ-centered, and Spirit-affected. So it must, therefore, be a God-centered message. For it is, Romans 1 verse 1, the gospel of God. It's about him. 
It concerns the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and the work of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit that this God has done for us. And to be faithful to the apostolic gospel, we must share Paul's concern for the, can I call it, the indispensable three R's of the gospel. I can't say R in a proper American way, so I hope you know what I'm trying to say. They are revelation, redemption, and regeneration. And let me try to put all that together for you. In the gospel, we see the Father's revelation in the Bible. Second, we see the Son's redemption centered on the cross. And thirdly, we see the Spirit's regeneration of our hearts. Trinitarian, scriptural, Christ-centered, Spirit-affected. And let me very briefly unfold these central truths of the gospel. Just lay them out as Paul has laid them out. These are the great truths. These are the truths that were herald, heralded in the Reformation 500 years ago that turned Europe upside down. These were the truths that did it. These are the truths we need to see trumpeted abroad again. Because... These are the truths that not just 500 years ago, but in every generation where these have been heralded, you've seen times of church refreshing and revival. These are the characteristic marks you'll always see being declared at those times when the church is being refreshed. So let me go through those three. First of all, the revelation of the Father. People of the gospel must be people who believe in and live by the supremacy of Scripture. Why? Because this is a truth Jesus himself taught. Do you remember Mark 7? Mark 7, the Pharisees, they come to Jesus and his disciples with quite an odd objection. Uh, they don't criticize their, um, their morality or their integrity. Their criticism to Jesus, do you remember? Your disciples don't wash their hands. That's the issue. Jesus replied, it was to do with a ceremonial hand washing that the disciples weren't doing. And Jesus replied, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. So clearly that sets up how we're to treat scripture according to Jesus. Clearly, for Jesus, where Scripture is of God, tradition and all other human thinking is of men. It is of people. And you may not, it is vain hypocrisy to equate the commandments of men with the doctrines of God. So Jesus' conviction is absolutely plain. Scripture is divine in origin. It, even when Moses spoke the words. So later you see in Mark 7 verse 10, what Moses said a couple of verses later is said to be the totally trustworthy word of God. So as such, because it is the word of God, Scripture is supreme, must drive and shape and control our thinking and overturn our assumptions. And any human reasoning or tradition must be subordinate to Scripture. 
And this is not easy. Because we fail to see how we've imbibed cultural assumptions, little cultural traditions. And so scripture must always be treated as supreme so that we can challenge the assumptions that we hold or maybe everyone around us holds, but which may not be scriptural. The word of God and the words of men are not and can never be equal authorities. And you know, without this principle of the supremacy of Scripture, there would have been no reformation of the church 500 years ago. This is the first principle that distinguishes Luther, the first reformer, from Erasmus, the scholar who made the Greek New Testament available to Luther, but who's never counted as a first reformer. Now, you may think, oh, poor old Erasmus. You know, he did all that work on the Greek New Testament. He never gets the credit for being the first reformer. He's getting the text available. Why? Erasmus had a clear regard for Scripture, but he would never have used Scripture to bring about any serious reformation. Because for him, the Scriptures held no clear governing authority. And that meant they actually had no ability to change things. Because if Scripture has the same authority as what you already think, it's not going to change your mind. For Erasmus, the Bible was just one voice among many. So its message could be tailored, squeezed, adjusted to fit his own vision of what Christianity was. To achieve substantial reformation of the church, it took Luther's attitude that scripture is the only sure foundation for belief. Sola scriptura. The Bible had to be acknowledged as the supreme authority, as God's word, and so allowed to contradict and overrule all other claims. And if it's not supreme, it itself will find its message hijacked and overruled. There's the first thing. We, if we want to see the reformation of the church in our day, a reformation by the gospel, we have to hold to the supremacy of Scripture. If God's word doesn't drive it, it won't be a reformation by his gospel. But second, from the revelation of the Father to the redemption of the Son, this next truth concerns the exclusive identity and completely sufficient work of Christ. There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. That's 1 Timothy 2.5. And therefore, Acts 4 verse 12, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And because... Christ came down as a completely sufficient saviour. And his redeeming work is totally sufficient for all our salvation. Therefore, that means there is nothing for us to add to top up his work to redeem ourselves. There is nothing we need to or can add. And so, true reformation must mean the teaching of justification by faith alone. Which is the litmus test. It's where the rubber hits the road. It proves you believe Christ is totally sufficient as a savior. And therefore, 
Since he is sufficient as a savior, his work is sufficient for me. I do not depend on my own merits, but rather there has been a swap of righteousness. I have given to Christ all my sin, and Christ has shared with me because of simple faith all oh, his perfect righteousness. Justification by faith alone is at the center ground of the biblical gospel. It is the beautiful, essential consequence of the all-sufficiency of Christ, the only Savior. And so this is a truth. It's not a truth that we just collect and pin up to say, aren't we orthodox? Because... I do really do not want to be about bare orthodoxy because you can have a dead orthodoxy that's only skin deep and that's not what we're about. Now take justification by faith alone. This changes lives. When a sinner can know I do not need to and I cannot earn my way to the right to pray. I cannot earn my way to calling God my Father. It's all a gift given freely in Jesus Christ. That, that doesn't just strike me as something I go, good, a correct thing to believe. This is glorious good news you want to mix, you want to sing. This is truth we sing about because it speaks of the majestic goodness of Christ. The sweet security that we can have in him. And so we sing, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock. We stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I've got to keep going when he shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found. Clothed in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne. Isn't that good news? These are truths that can transform the vicious, the sad, the despairing into joy-filled, radiant, generous, kind saints. Because when they know how they've been loved, they begin to love. And if you don't know the good news of God's grace, you can't love. So we're not just being cerebral to talk about these truths. Here are truths that are important to believe. That's not the issue. These truths transform. They are good news. And that's why I want to make a call for reformation. Not a simple call for orthodoxy. Not a box ticking, yes, let's believe what is officially approved by the church. Yes, we do do that. Orthodox belief is vitally important, but we don't want a skin deep orthodoxy. You just affirm it on paper and not in our hearts. It's transformation we want to see. I want to see more people embrace this gospel such that they are affected and changed. They find joy in Jesus. They delight in God. They think, here's a glory I never imagined before. Here's security before such a kind God I never knew before. And knowing such love and glory, they become loving, generous, 
glorious. Head and heart are aligned. And that leads us on to our third essential truth of the gospel. The revelation of the Father, the redemption of the Son, and the regeneration of the Spirit. Again, you see, in the Reformation, and every time you see a revival of the church, this truth is heralded. This. That, friends, our problem as sinners is not superficial or small. Our problem, naturally, is not just you think, oh, I can't quite be bothered to be holy enough for God. Because if that's the problem, maybe I should just shout at you to try harder. But that won't work. And actually, my compassion will swell towards you when I realize sinners can't help it. They can't just try harder. Naturally, we are lost, blind, dead. I just can't shout at people to try harder. People are addicts to sin. We need something far deeper. We need to be born again. We need our hearts to be turned as the Spirit does deep work in them so that I actually desire differently. So that <clears throat> where <clears throat> once I didn't love God at all, I might try to buy him off because I feel I ought to. Instead, my heart is turned so that I actually want him, desire him, love him, adore him. For as Jesus repeatedly pointed out to the Pharisees, orthodoxy is not orthodoxy. It's just not orthodox without orthocardia, a rightness of heart. You can confess the right truths. You can act in the right way and be a whitewashed tomb. That wouldn't be reformation, it would be camouflage. And so as the Puritan Richard Baxter so wonderfully put it, I wish I could have heard him say this. He said, alas, can we think that the reformation is brought about when we just cast out a few ceremonies and change some clothing and gestures and forms Oh, no, sirs, it is the converting and saving of souls that is our business. That is the chiefest part of reformation. Our first need, he's saying, is not correct behavior. You can have correctly behaving dry bones. We need a new birth and a new heart that loves God. It means true reformation starts at home. This is not a project for heroes to go out in their own strength and bring reformation to the poor benighted others who need it. Reformation starts at home as the gospel is worked down into our hearts so that we don't just use the language of grace and deny its reality with a proud harshness or thankless lack of joy. So my question is this. Because just, just as I talk about a change of heart and being born again, don't you think, I wish my heart were more like that? My heart feels so cold and cloddish. I wish my heart pounded more for Jesus. I wish it was softer towards Jesus. Don't you just instinctively think you want that? And so the question is, what does that? 
What does that work in hearts? You know, Jonathan Edwards, great British theologian, he was convinced it was, well, yes. He was convinced it was the doctrine of justification by faith alone that brought the revival in his day, in his church. It was the main truth, he said, that the Spirit used to drive the awakening. That good news of justification, that God declares sinners righteous with the righteousness of Christ. And others like John Wesley said the same thing. They said, times of spiritual refreshment, fruitfulness, are always marked by emphatic teaching on two things. Do you know what they are? Times of revival are always marked by teaching on two things. One, the saving work of Christ. Two, the new birth. The two go together. And it's the message of the saving work of Christ and justification by faith alone that is the message that causes people to be born again, that causes change in hearts. The two go together. Do you want to turn to John 3 to see this in action? <clears throat> John 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and the, the bit we remember in John 3 is he's talking to Nicodemus about the need to be born again. That's verses 1 to 13. So he's, he's telling G, uh, Nicodemus about the need to be born again. Nicodemus doesn't understand it. Where does Jesus go? Verse 14. Look at this. Look at the connection now. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Friends, it is this sight of the Son of Man lifted up in his strange, unexpected glory, proving the love of his Father, that is what turns hearts. That's what will get your blood pumping for Jesus. That is what turns hearts from delighting in sin and dreading God to delighting in God and dreading sin. It's there on the cross. You, you go through life imagining God as less than he is, less beautiful, less kind, less good, and so you don't dare approach him. But there on the cross, there you taste the goodness and the kindness of God fully revealed and then we love because he first loved us you know today many rightly bemoan the superficiality the lovelessness the spiritual hollowness that we see spread throughout the church but friends superficial pragmatic answers are not the solution. A moral campaign for better Christian behavior will not touch the roots of the problem. The church today is in great need of reformation. But true reformation happens from the inside out as the Spirit heals hearts with the balm of the gospel. You know, Richard Sibbs, the Puritan, said, after the Reformation had been going a hundred years, he said, 
In these last hundred years in time of Reformation, there's been more spirit, more lightsomeness, more comfort. Christians have lived and died more comfortably because why? Christ has been more known. The gospel of Christ's redemption and the Spirit's regeneration is not just a message for outsiders. It is our only hope if we are to see renewal and reformation in our own lives, in the church, in our day. This is the message that does it. And I want to be clear that The gospel is not simply revelation, redemption, regeneration. The gospel is the revelation of the Father. The redemption of the Son. The regeneration of the Spirit. Because the biblical gospel, and I want to press in to see this tomorrow, is a God-centered gospel. It is, after all, 1 Timothy 1.11, the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. So through the gospel shines the light of the knowledge of the glory of a speaking, revealing God. Of a merciful, gracious God. A God who is love and therefore who looks on the heart more than the appearance. That's the sort of God we're talking about. The gospel brings us to enjoy him. And so that's why the glory of God in the face of Christ has always been the lodestar, the guiding light of reformation and refreshment in the church. When Christians have appreciated and adored God as all sufficient, all beautiful, all necessary, That's when they've been awakened and made fruitful. Christians who get that for them, the world is not enough. The glory and acclaim of the world pale beside the allure of Jesus Christ. When you've seen him revealed in the gospel. In a reformation, God is gloried in, adored, wondered at. So as we look at the gospel over the next day together, what effect should this gospel have on us? What should happen? He must increase. I must decrease. In the gospel is revealed the glory of the loving triune God. And in his light, we creatures, we sinners, are exposed. We're exposed for little. We're exposed as failures. And the more we see of the gospel, the more... The three persons of the Trinity and their work of revelation, redemption, regeneration, the more they are glorified and the more we diminish. Through the gospel, we come to realize that without God's revelation, we are left groping in the darkness of ignorance. Without the redemption of the Son, we're just lost in our guilt. Without the regeneration of the Spirit, we are just helplessly enslaved to our sin. In the gospel, God is exalted. And our being diminished doesn't feel like a bad thing. Because he's become glorious to us. We want more of him. Because then we have more joy. Only then, when he is lifted up, 
does he draw all people to himself? Times of reformation and renewal in the church have always been marked by that perspective. That unlike how we naturally think, in the light of the gospel, we come to realize, I'm not great. I'm not glorious and beautiful. I'm created in the image of God, but I'm a failure. At the sounding of the gospel, at the lifting up of Christ, we're like Isaiah, at the vision of the Lord when he was high and lifted up. And like Isaiah, when we see the glory of God, we say, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. But if you have a gospel where sin is a very small problem, and Christ therefore just chips in to help out a little bit, then it's never going to have that happifying effect. The humility we learn at the foot of the gospel, glorying in Christ, not ourselves. Actually, friends, it doesn't make sense to the world, but that's the wellspring of gospel health. Because when your eyes are opened to the love of God for sinners, that's when you can drop the mask and be honest. Because you're not constantly trying to pretend to be all sorted to get accepted. The only reason you've accepted justification by faith alone is because you've acknowledged, I'm a failure. I need Christ's redemption. So the time for pretense is over. Condemned as sinners and justified we can begin to be honest about ourselves. Loved despite our unloveliness, we begin to love. Given peace with God, we begin to know an inner peace and joy. Shown the magnificence of God above all things, actually makes us more resilient because we tremble and wonder at God and are not so bothered about the glory of men and what others think of us. And you know, that was the transformation Martin Luther himself experienced at this gospel. Because Martin Luther, we tend to think of him as a bold, very bold man. And he was, but actually, as a young man, he was extremely anxious. He said, I would be frightened even by a leaf blown in the wind. And that changed through his encounter with the gospel of Christ. As his great biographer, Roland Bainton, records, in these are the last words of Roland Bainton's Wonderful biography of Martin Luther. Bainton writes this. The God of Luther, as of Moses, was the God who inhabits the storm clouds and rides on the wings of the wind. At his nod, the earth trembles. The people before him are as a drop in the bucket. He is a God of majesty and power, inscrutable, terrifying, devastating, and consuming in his anger. Yet, the all-terrible is the all-merciful. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord. But how shall we know this? In Christ, only in Christ, in the Lord of life, born in the squalor of a cow stall, dying 
as a malefactor under the desertion and derision of men, crying unto God and receiving for answer only the trembling of the earth and the blinding of the sun, even by God forsaken, and in that hour taking to himself and annihilating our iniquity, trampling down the hosts of hell and disclosing within the wrath of the all-terrible the love that will not let us go. And this was the effect, said Luther, it says Bainton about Luther. No longer did Luther tremble at the rustling of a wind-blown leaf. And instead of calling on St. Anne, he declared himself able to laugh at thunder and jagged bolts out of the storm. This gospel was what enabled him to utter words such as these. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. That was humility. But the humility Luther found before the majesty and mercy of God, it wasn't the kind of thing we often imagine gloomy, morose. This was full-throttled, joyous, valiant humility. And that is the stamp of the humility to be found in the gospel of the glory of God. That is the bearing of one who is refreshed by the gospel. When you are captivated by the magnificence of God, then you won't be so drawn to a man-centered therapeutic religion. Then... Under the radiance of his glory, you won't be so drawn to establish your own little empire. Our tiny achievements under his glory will seem petty. Our rivalries, petty rivalries, personal agendas, feuds, odious. He will loom large. And when he looms large, we will become bolder to please God and not people. And then we won't dither or stammer with the gospel. We'll be bold. And yet with that boldness, aware of our own redemption, we will share Christ's gentleness, his meekness. And so we won't break a bruised reed. It means we'll be quick to serve quick to bless, quick to repent, quick to laugh at ourselves because our glory is not ourselves but Christ. That is the reformation I want to see. Churches filled with believers who adore God because of this beautiful gospel. Now, you could think, yes, a grand vision. But isn't dreaming of a new reformation a bit grand? A bit much? I mean, look, it's hardly any of us. And it's just us. Really? But such a dream of the reformation of the church, it doesn't depend on our brilliance or our numbers. Reformation means raising the dead. And there is no voice powerful enough to awaken the dead. No human voice. But a divine voice. The word heralded can. And you know, Luther's Wittenberg, Calvin's Geneva... They weren't big. They didn't have great numbers to start with. Yeah, but between the friends around the table in Wittenberg and those few students in the Academy of Geneva, the world was changed. There was a fellowship around the gospel for the reformation of the church. So may I 
draw to a close now by asking you to turn to Isaiah 53. I'd just like you to look over those familiar words in Isaiah 53. Of the suffering servant pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, redeeming, showing his unique, gracious glory. Now, what is a fit response to that Savior? Isaiah 54. Here's how Christians respond Sing. O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes, for... You will spread abroad to the right and to the left. Your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. In the light of this Savior, we're not to hunker down, cower at the secularization of the culture or the troubles of the church. We are to sing. Sing out the glories of our Redeemer. We are to enlarge the tent for we will spread abroad to the right and to the left. Sing and enlarge the tent of Jesus Christ. Because the death of Christ means the life of the church. He suffers and his church flourishes. He's lifted up and draws all people to himself. That is what he died for. The growing church is his hard-earned reward. And you know, it was this passage in Isaiah 54 that the great missionary William Carey preached as he left England to take the gospel to India. And seeking to stir the church to global mission, Carey said this, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Friends, our God and his gospel are glorious, powerful, life imparting. And so I say, come on, let's be in this together. Together. Let's Support each other as we lift up Christ crucified before the world through his word so that the spirit enlivens the hearts of many and brings health to his church again. Let's enjoy and herald his all sufficiency so that we no longer tremble at a leaf blown by the wind but we laugh at thunder and jagged bolts out of the storm so that we stand before the world and say, here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. Could I ask you to stand? I would like to use just a couple of verses from... Psalm 115, you could turn to it if you like. As a way for us to dedicate ourselves afresh today to this God and his gospel. Psalm 115, verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. The heavens are the Lord's heavens. I'm going on to verse 16 here. But the earth he's given to the children of man. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into the silence. But we, we will bless the Lord from this time forth 
and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you.